and the Inner Hebrides. Oban once earned its living in the fishing business. Now it's a hugely popular holiday town, a busy ferry port, and the unofficial capital of the Western Highlands. Two men were instrumental in the early development of Oban in the 18th century. They were the Stevenson brothers, Hugh and John. Poor but enterprising, they became skilled tradesmen and started building and then chartering ships. Their vessels transformed the little fishing village into a major trading port. The Stevensons expanded their interests, acquiring farms, quarries and tanneries. Then there was the whisky. For this and other blessings, the Stevenson boys were dubbed the founding fathers of Oban. Another illustrious name locally is McCaig. They were a powerful family here in the 19th century, and Oban's most famous landmark, the McCaig Tower, dominates the town. The McCaig Empire was built on tobacco, tourism and banking, and it was John Stuart McCaig who decided, as a good and philanthropic Victorian, to build a monument to his family, and at the same time, to give work to the unemployed stonemasons of Oban. The Highlands always attracted artists and poets. Wordsworth, Sir Walter Scott, Keats and Tennyson all found inspiration here. No one captured the mood and flavour of the place better than Felix Mendelssohn. He was just 20 years old when he sat here looking out at the islands and claimed to be so overcome by the beauty around him that the strains of the Hebridean overture just came into his head. Now let's waft down to the Corran Halls to see what will inspire the experts on today's Antiques Roadshow. That comes on the miscellaneous. They're very useful. Okay. I think you should go to the book people with this, even though it may be that the cover is more important than the yes. contents yes. now, if you see what I mean. You know, you brought along the perfect thing for sitting in your conservatory on the edge of your garden, directing your gardeners as they are putting, potting on all the plants. It really is a magnificent piece of furniture. And what I long to know is where you got it from. We bought a house in 1984, and the seller of the house just left it in the garden. Uh -huh. And then my husband and I decided to make a feature of it in a side garden. And it's been there ever since. I think it's actually a bit of, of winter garden furniture. I can see it in a dripping corner of a conservatory with the sound of water behind, surrounded by ferns and aspidistras. Now, what is interesting about it, and I long to know how it got here, I think it was made in Portugal. Ah. The Portuguese in the late 19th century specialised very much in these sort of tortoiseshell glazes. But it is a massive hunk to transport around. I mean, it's a, it's a it is. very solid object. <laughs> uh, Caldas, Caldas de, de, de la Reina was the great factory in Portugal that made this kind of ware. Mm -hmm. and that's where I think it comes from. Ah. I've never seen one before, and, I, and you've never seen another one, have you? No. Uh -huh. um, I think you should have it insured outside and make sure your insurers cover you for something in the garden. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, 2,000 pounds, maybe? As much as that. Uh, I mean, if you wanted to go out and buy another one, it would be oh. very hard to do. Yes, yes. Uh, and as I found at the beginning, it's very comfortable. Oh, yes. It's extremely comfortable. My grandfather and his father were in a shipping partnership, and they travelled extensively in the Baltic countries as far as St. Petersburg, and they obviously acquired this during that period. There is a note with it which says, acquired from the old curiosity shop, St. Petersburg. And what date was that? That would have been around about the turn of the century, as far as I can guess, give or take ten years. Yes. Well, actually, around and about the turn of the century is exactly when it's made. And that's exactly why it's a rather sophisticated one, really. It's almost the last gasp of icon making before the Russian Revolution. And, of course, with the Russian Revolution, the making of sophisticated icons was not, simply not allowed. So, in a way, this is a very heightened view of a very ancient art form that comes from Byzantium. Um, have you thought more about this, this, this metal? Tell me what you think about that. Well, to me, the thing is almost divided into two parts. One is the very ornate and stylized metal surround, and the other is the essential human uh, part of these faces, looking out with compassion. 
well, absolutely right, and compassion would be central to all of that. This is a very important object in the Orthodox religion, and in a way, this silver casing um, is there to protect what is seen as a metaphor for heaven. Icons are tiny bits of heaven snatched down um, for the mortal world to look at, and it's really how they've been viewed for a very long time. So in order to sort of um, to protect them, these oclads have been made, um, the, 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 the boxes, if you like, to, to cover the icon. It's probably come to as an enormous surprise to you that underneath this is a meticulously painted icon in, in full underneath here. If we were to unpin these nails and take it off, we would find the, the, the entire icon in paint with the same level of sophistication as we find here. It would be quite forgivable for you to imagine that these images were simply painted at a later stage, not so. Yes. Um, the old curiosity shop is something I want to return to because I don't believe it was an old curiosity shop. I think that um, he went to one of the most famous goldsmiths in Russia at that time. And I know he did, as a matter of fact, because at the foot of the icon here, I can see the signature of a goldsmith called Pavel Ovchinikov, who was a competitor of Fabergé and somebody that liked to work in the old Russian taste. Um, they're very important in Russian homes, too. They occupied the right angles of rooms, because it's long been believed that right angles were inhabited by the devil himself, that evil mm. lived at right angles. So these were positioned in a room above the head at the corner of the room. You'd have a collection of them, probably. Anyway, a beautiful, beautiful relic of pre-revolutionary Russia. Um, I think it's rather sort of awful to try to price it at all, really, because it is um, a holy image, and I'm going to have a go at it. I think it's worth um, 1,500 pounds for insurance. Yes, thank you. I received it as a present when I was probably about four, and the judge of that is the fact that I could sit on it and with my little legs paddle along, it had nothing, no mechanical propulsion. So I was the engine. So it was your bottom? It was my bottom. That did all way. this, all this um, sort of pushing down at That's the top right. here. That's right. Well, you're forgiven because at least you didn't destroy the thing. No. And when you say you were given it uh, when you were before, who was the donor? I think it was my grandfather. Right. But at that age, it's difficult to remember. Quite, quite. It's a fantastic looking bit of machinery, isn't it? Isn't it? You've got um, a model of a P2 Alfa Romeo racing car, and it dates from the 1930s. Now, you've got it in its traditional Italian racing colors, uh, the exhaust zipping out to the back here, the big filler cap so that you could put the uh, petrol in at enormous speed, and lovely bits of detail. Um, if we look at the wheel here at the back, we've got the spoked wheel and the, the quick quick release um, uh, racing finish on that pub. It was much more pub. crude, wasn't it, in those days? It was hardly high-tech, was it? No. When, you, when one looks at the way that racing cars... Ex exactly. <laughs> if it doesn't fit, hit it. Um, and looking at it this side, we've got the handbrake and... Um, here is the arbor where it would have been wound up with the key. Now, I take it you don't have the key. Do you know, I never knew it had mechanical innards. You're not serious. I am serious. You've had it all this time. I've had it, it must be 70 years now. Well, underneath I, here. I was the engine always. So you said, so as a lad, you never took these screws off no. and looked and saw what was underneath. No. In there is a really powerful uh, clockwork motor. I mean, these things were built to really mm. zap. Mm. Um, and they were made in France, and they made them in lots of different colours. And uh, they are very popular with collectors because they appeal to two different types of collectors. On the one hand, you have the toy collectors. You also have the owners of the real cars and of real Alfa Romeos generally who want this because it's a really, really good toy representation of the real thing. Um, and as we know, because of the bottom damage, it's not in brilliant condition, so the value is going to be limited by its condition, but even so, I would have thought we're talking about around 1,200 to maybe 1,500 pounds. Nice. So, um, when you get it home, see if you can find a clock key to fit this, and you'll never have to sit on it again. Thank you.
It was part of a very large collection which was put together by Miss Hope McDougall of McDougall, who was the daughter and then sister and then aunt to clan chiefs, a very, oh, very, very high-born high, lady. High, high and she collected literally thousands of items in her grand fastness down at Ganavan near Oban. And this is really a drawer of sewing as she displayed it in the private museum that she set up in her house. So her house became a museum? Yes. Just about sewing? Oh, no. I mean, everything from an industrial loom to peat spades to fishing. Obviously, she's died, I imagine. And what, what has happened to the collection? Well, very quickly, the trustees and an army of local people packed it into boxes and put it into store. And we are now, Jackie and I are just now, at the very, very beginning of starting to unpack it and document it and show it to the community. What quantity are you dealing with? Hundreds, thousands? We think it's a bare minimum 3,000. Some people reckon 5,000 artefacts. But all relevant to Scotland? Yes, yes, comparative with other parts of the world, right. but it's above all a Scottish collection. Let's look in the box and see, because... It was about the beginning of the 40s, there was a land girl, and it was my friend who gave me it, because she knew I had children, and so I've had it for a long, long time. Well, he's wonderful, and I think he dates back to the 30s. He's made of a composition, yes. his face and his hands, and of course, the rest of his body is a cardboard box. Yes. Whoop. There we are for sweeties. Um, it's lovely to have a Father Christmas like that. Yes. And when they when they come in to auctions for sale, it's uh -huh. quite rare. Uh -huh. And if he were to come up for auction, I can see him making about two hundred to three hundred pounds. But I'll have to keep him. I've got a granddaughter now. <laughs> The tobacco industry goes beyond the distillery history, which people generally think of as the beginning of Oban. Yes. But there was a tobacco factory dealing directly with the new business of tobacco growing in Virginia at the very beginning of the 18th century in Oban. So it, it, it's very much how the town grew up. It grew up on tobacco and alcohol, in I'm effect. I'm sorry to say it did. Why well, be sorry? I mean, <laughs> it's a fact of life. These are very familiar, of course, the Scottish snuff mull. Very nice example with all its bits for preparing and serving the snuff. And, of course, on a more domestic scale, this is what you put in your pocket. I love these little tiny ones. Were they for ladies? This one certainly was. This one was owned by Colleen McDougall, who was the, the previous chief of the clan McDougall. Right. Whether she used it herself, I don't well, know. Well, ladies did take snuff. I mean, it's fairly established, isn't it? And certainly the gentry of Scotland, with their connections with the old alliance mm. in France, were great snuff takers. These, as you, as you know, are grand objects. I mean, they're very collectible, and one like that, I mean, you're looking at several hundred pounds, because it's such a classic example. The great quality to me of much of the thing, much of the collection, of course, is that values rarely enter into it. Now, talking of values and low values, what on earth is that? That is from Ford Post Office. Ford is a tiny village on Loch Awe, and may maybe 30 miles from Oban. Yes. And it closed in 1986, and the postmistress, Mamie Cameron, was there for 40 years. Oh, right. Um, and when the post office closed down, she gave the contents, effectively, from her desk. I think we've also got the desk to right. this Right, so these are simply the, the postal stamps. The postal stamps, So when yes. you wanted Ford on your lap, she, she stamped the postage. She did, that's with right. With the right postal stamp, that's great. Miss McDougall did clear out an awful lot of shops locally, the yes. blacksmiths, and and the boot makers and the tobacco. So as soon as the shop closed, she was on the doorstep, she putting was. it all in her bag. Well, I thought it had something to do with tea. I don't know. What do you do with tea in there? Well, it would leak a, out through the bottom. A tea trolley, you know. Uh, I see what you mean. Uh, uh, well, it's, an, it's, it's certainly you're on the right line. It's to uh, do with eating and drinking. Ah. Uh, it's actually a cheese coaster. Oh, is that what it is? You can imagine, depending on what part of the country you come from, yeah. half a cheese here. Yeah. I'm a Stilton man, I'm from Leicestershire. Oh, great. Where are you from? Oh, I'm from Rorschach. Is there a local cheese? <laughs> no. No, I don't think so. It's called a coaster because it goes along the dining table. And you've got the wheels here, which are so, so delightful, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Very, very pretty. Mm -hmm. And this whole thing dates from about 1780, 1800, late Georgian. Oh. But of course, we've got a condition problem here. You can see quite clearly this quite bad damage there. Yes. But, but it's a, a tiny one, which is lovely. They're usually bigger. And that wonderful outline, that's almost zigzag, is really interesting. I'm rather, rather, rather taken by that. I think it's rather yeah. sweet. What's it worth? Well, I thought it was Victorian, but uh, seeing that you said it was earlier than that, I would say maybe two hundred pounds. So you, what, you've upgraded as we've been talking, exactly. have you? What do you, what were you going to think originally as Victorian? 
Oh, maybe 120. Right. 500 pounds. Oh, great. So, <laughs> lovely. <laughs> But this is what we believe and is marked in her inventory as a Shetland wedding dress, so knitted a, in Shetland one knitted, tie wool. Now, when would that have been made? I don't know, but the style of it looks to me slightly drop waisted. It's rather extraordinary. It's almost sort of cut, cut on the bias, it is. isn't it's it? It's almost not yes. cut, but, but knitted, knitted yes, on the bias. Yes. I mean, it's an amazingly complicated piece of knitting. Fantastic now, piece of knitting. This, of course, is so. What are we looking at? Early nineteenth century. I, I would say later. Actually, later. I'm not entirely sure. We've got a lot of work to do on this because. That even the Shetland Museum doesn't have these. These are really, as far as we know, Genius. very rare items. You, you mean you've got more than one? We've got two. We've Good. got a beautiful coral pink one as well. And there's none in the Shetlands? No. But do they acknowledge they existed? They do now. They didn't know they existed yeah. until we talked And the idea of a woolen wedding dress is completely new to me, but of course, if it's yes. the only yes. textile technique you have, yes. of course you make it. And we only assume it's a wedding dress. It's marked down as one. But well, it's, it's a very, very fine dress. If not for best. Well, it's a wonderful thing. This, I think, is, you know, is probably significantly valuable. I have no idea, but it's such a rarity. I think it's, to me, very exciting to see how a local lady can involve herself in ordinary life and leave it for the future. Three cheers for Miss McDougall. Time to show you this week's archive clips. Remember, we're asking you to choose the items we'll include in the last programme of the series to celebrate our 25 years on the road. And this week, our subject is the great collections that have come up over the years. My father collected them uh, extensively through most of his life. Right. And uh, he passed them on to Mum now that he's gone. Uh, and we, we're still learning about what they are and right. where they're from, really. Now, that is marvellous. These are very collectible. Gosh, that is a very rare box. That is the most wonderful piece. A water collection, I mean, full marks to your father. Well, you probably know that uh, the majority of these pictures in this gallery, I should call it, um, are by members of the Glasgow School, the Glasgow Boys. Mm. And they were a group of artists who sort of formed together in the 1880s. And initially, they weren't terribly well received. And it wasn't until really a little bit later that people in Glasgow began to realize that actually there was a bit of talent here and they started to get very enthusiastic. This is far and away the best collection of pictures that I've seen on the show in whatever it is, eight, or eight years or so. My grandfather had good and taste. And he had very good taste. <laughs> and I should think he probably paid hardly anything for them. My father, particularly, had a great love of Worcester China, mm -hmm. um, and this is part of what he has left yes. to me. Did he know the painters himself? I'm not sure whether my father actually knew, but certainly my grandfather, mm -hmm. who was a well-known character in mm -hmm. Worcester, mm -hmm. he certainly knew Harry Davis and the Stintons. Right, and we can see, see their work here. And I can see the, the magic name Harry Davis on this one. Yes. We've got some very unusual pieces in the, to get this subject. He's famous really for his French style landscapes and sheep. Here you've got a cottage scene. Yes. These were made as labours of love by the artists, as just great bits of porcelain. But now they're expensive treasures too. Henry Moore was the most original artist of the 20th century. In fact, not, in, not since Rodin in the 19th century, I think, had anybody been quite so original as him. You can imagine my surprise to see such an enormous collection of letters from this incredibly great artist and quite a few of them illustrated like this one to dearest evelyn now who is dearest evelyn she's my mother you've got a, co a collection here of what 30 30 odd love about letters 30 ones, yeah. well love letters very yes. intimate letters anyway shall we say many with uh, lovely uh, drawings in i mean this is just so typical of of, of henry moore it just it, 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 it's breathtaking so to register your vote, ring 08700 100 870 and when you hear the prompt, press 1, 2, 3 or 4 on your telephone keypad, depending on your choice. Or you could see the clips again in full on our website and you can vote online at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash antiques. Next time, another four clips to choose from. They're on the tops of old cigar boxes, I understand. Actually, uh, they, uh, that, that makes sense. They're about the right size for that, aren't they? Yes. And, and um, how did you get them? 
My mother got them from an old friend uh, with whom Leslie Hunter used to come and stay on holidays and things, and he would go out into the local surroundings and just paint. So these are by Leslie life. Hunter? Yeah. And I don't suppose you ever met him, did you? Your no. mother must have met him, of course. She may have done, but I really don't know, because my mother died when I was in my 20s. And where was the house? In Lenzi, which is just outside Glasgow. Uh -huh. um, because he, he painted the most um, wonderful pictures sometimes, but he was a disorderly person. He didn't really have much sense of money or, or uh, much practical sense at all. No. I think he was quite otherworldly. He is regarded as a so-called Scottish colourist, yes. like Cadell or Ferguson. Um, and when he's doing this kind of very informal oil sketch for his own pleasure and interest, I find him absolutely wonderful. I particularly like this one on the left. Uh, it's so fresh and it shows his thinking so very clearly. Um, I love the way he leaves the grain of yes. the wood, uh, just the tobacco, the, the cigar box lid, just left. So he's using the colour of the board to come through as part of the picture. Very quick and impressionistic. And do you like that about yes, them? Yes, I do. I, they're very natural looking. They're, they're very much like the countryside round about where I used to live as a child. Yes. Yeah. I particularly like the way he's used the end of the brush in the wet paint, because they're painted quite quickly, aren't yes, they? Yes, they have been, yes. At some yes, speed think, and with yes, some energy. Yes, I think so. And he's taken the end of the brush and he's pushed it into the sky just to suggest a bit more of cloud, and he's pushing the paint around with, uh, with maybe his hands as well, although I can't see any fingerprints. He's using quite a broad brush and quite a thick paint. Yes. Uh, having a lot of fun just catching an effect well, of the I think the, he was just landscape. very much on holiday, you know, yes. going out and doing it through. A painter enjoying himself. himself. Yeah. Yeah. But his life is so interesting, isn't it? His parents took him to America when he was very young, and he uh, began to teach himself how to paint. His parents really? came back to Scotland, yeah. and he stayed on, and I believe he had an exhibition in San Francisco, the entire contents of which was destroyed by an earthquake in the beginning of the 20th century. Really? Yes, the entire contents. I didn't know that. Uh, he, he earned enough money to work his passage, yeah. and ended up back in Scotland. These, I suspect, might have been done in the 1920s. Does that add, add up to, in yes, your family yes, history? Yes, it could do, because um, I, they were in my parents' home, you know, whatever I can remember. Of course, I was born in the 1920s. <laughs> so, but uh, they may very well have been around that period that he was there. I think that the market's very hungry for a good Scottish colourist picture. So it wouldn't surprise me at all that the one on the left, at least, should be worth six to eight thousand pounds. Small though it is. That surprises me a little. But the one on the right, I mean, I think the market's fickle. They may decide that that is not quite as nice. Yeah. Either way, I, I would probably say that that is, is worth only about a mere three to four thousand pounds, the one on the right. Well, thank you very much for bringing them. I think they're absolutely lovely. Oh, it's very interesting. Go and put them back in the wall. OK. <laughs> Thank you very much. Three feet eleven. And four foot two. And that one's an one. Right, right. I mean, what's interesting about that, it's not the first time I've seen cabinets made like this. And obviously, it suggests they're made for a, a niche in a particular house. Mm -hmm. One imagines perhaps either side of a big fireplace, where you've architecturally you've just got a slightly narrower niche, just by four inches. Very strange. Tell me, where do these come from? In Russia. From my Russia? Da yes, my dad lived over there for about six years. Right, right. The wood is fascinating. and it, uh, There are two things which are a real giveaway for this. The style is somewhat Germanic, with this bow fronted, this concave front here. Mm -hmm. It's very, very Germanic. The reason for that, the German architects and designers were working from Catherine the Great onwards in Russia. And, of course, there's another thing, is the timber itself. It was a wood much favoured by the Empress and the Emperor, right. um, especially uh, Nicholas and Alexander, for example, in the early 20th century, and they loved this type of birch. Which birch? But a specific type of birch, specific to Estonia Karelia, it's known as Karelian birch. All oh, right. Which I think is what northern Russia or Finland area, that sort of area. Mm. And there are huge forests of it, so uh -huh. it was a common local wood, especially in times of blockade of Europe when the French were blockaded by the English Navy in the early 19th century, they couldn't get the mahoganies and the precious woods from South America and the Caribbean, and so they would use their lo local native timbers. But of course, they're much cheaper as well, so there's an economic factor as well. 
and it's difficult to know quite what sort of house these were made for. Probably quite a substantial house, certainly not a peasant's house or a farmer's house, but probably not one of the grand aristocratic houses, but that's sort of halfway between. And they date probably 1810 at the very earliest, if, let's say if they were a Moscow house, a slightly provincial house, probably 1820 or even as late as 1830 or 40. But I don't think the exact date within 10 years matters, because what we have is a very, very stylish pair of cabinets indeed, or not quite a pair, which is a shame, they're not quite a pair. <laughs> very quickly, I just want to look, I mean, what do you think these, have you got one at your end, this little cupboard? one at each end here too, yes, and I haven't got keys for them, sorry. I have never, there doesn't seem just, to be I'll a cabinet inside. inside, no. What have we got inside? Very, very plain. Well, all you can see is just in there. That's right. It's been boarded I don't up know again. Why. Well, one can only imagine they were putting the chamber pots in. Oh, of course, that's a possibility, yes. I think they're probably dining room pieces, dining room sideboards. So they probably had tons of food and wine spilt on them, which is, helps the patination. And you had little potties in each end, so the gentleman could do whatever necessary yeah, when the ladies had left the room, I think. Um, <laughs> what insurance value have you got on them at the moment? I haven't. Just ordinary house insurance under the household insurance. Would well, you realise what these would make at auction? These at auction would make a minimum of 20 to 30,000 pounds. The pair? And certainly for insurance, I'm afraid, forget 20,000 or 30,000, got to be thinking in terms of 40 or 50,000 pounds for insurance. Oh. Oof. <laughs> That's terrible. Oh, well, I like them. I don't want to buy I them. I love them. <laughs> This particular chain was the province of Oban in days gone by, before we merged into a larger authority. But this was the, the province of Oban's chain. So, in honour of your visit today and to the people of Oban, we decided to bring it out to say... Wonderful. And these are the arms of Oban? They're Oban on, on, and, on the, and the front, Lords of the they? Isles. Yes, indeed. Uh, excellent. But you've also brought along a much more, if I may say, much more interesting oh, yeah. chain. Because, looking at it, it's got so many wonderful features, particularly the boats and the castle and the coat of arms. What can you tell me about um, the, these various symbols? Uh, Rossi was a very important port in days gone by. Yes. The Lord Mayor of London invited all the province of the United Kingdom to London. Yes. The Marquis of Butte, who is resident oh, in London, yes. wasn't there. He was down at the show and he was not greatly enamoured that the Rossi had a single tier chain only. <laughs> so in return, the Marquis, at his own expense, yes. presented this triple chain to the borough of Rossi, which, as you'll see, has Scottish perils, and the galleons yes. uh, depicting that Rossi was an important seaport at that particular time. Right. With the chain went the title of Admiral of the Clyde. What a wonderful title. Ah, yes, yeah. not been rescinded. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the first thing that I'm struck when, you know, I pick it up is the sheer weight of it. Yes. And it is 15 karat gold. The value of the gold alone is, is pretty considerable. But as you rightly pointed out, throughout the whole chain here, that is lovely little pearls in set all around. And what I particularly like are the fact that the galleons have what appear to be carved rock crystal behind them, like sort of suns, the rising suns. But um, the sheer quality of it is absolutely stunning. Now, there's one thing that has uh, signaled real alarm bells in my mind, and that is this rather faded stamping here, which says Barkentin and Kral. Now, they were very interesting makers particularly that they were makers for one of the most important architects and designers of the 19th century, a man called William Burgess. The only thing is that this is not what I call absolutely typical because his style is much more with big cabochon stones and gems and although we've got pearls, however, it is quite possible that this was based on a design by Burgess and if it is a Burgess design, you have something very, very valuable really? indeed. Um, are we allowed to know what it's insured for? I think in excess of 25,000. That, um, that was a little while back. Yes, I, I, I have to tell you that I think that is exceptionally modest, regardless of whether it is by Burgess or not, because 
if it's not by Burgess, I think it should be insured for nearly three times that amount. Really? Yes. Really? Remember, this is 15 karat gold. Yes. <laughs> now, if it's if it can be traced to a Burgess design, then you better rush off to yeah, the we've insurers. Gold. We've stopped gold. <laughs> because I think we're then looking well in excess of 100,000 really? up to possibly 150,000. Yeah. Well, it's a fantastic well, piece. Thank you, thank you much. so much for bringing That's it along. Well, we're grateful to you. Thank you very much indeed. Our adopted great, great, great uncle was a Glasgow merchant and he found this treasure chest in the sand on the Gold Coast, but alas, it didn't have any treasure. So how long sad. ago are we talking about? Oh, 17 something. Meanwhile, yes. your treasure chest. Yes. So you had it as children? Yes, it was our treasure chest. We're twins. In, in, in here, we have the secret compartment where we kept all our special treasures. Very, very special. This treasures. is it's very ancient. It's by a pin held together. And this is the drawer. And here is the treasure. Our mother's <laughs> jade necklace. <laughs> and spillicans. We all love playing spillicans. It was given to me for a charity store. I took it to a friend who was knowledgeable in antiques and asked her what she thought I should give for it if I... That's very honest uh, of you, a good way well, to do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not fair to the charity, is it? When she told me, I was tempted myself to buy it. And was it in this lovely, bright, iridescent condition when you got it? Not quite. The lady had used it for her paintbrushes. Really? And she had surrounded the rim with elastoplast and various things, maybe to protect the rim, I don't know. But when I took it off and washed it, mm. I thought, well, this is lovely. I'm going to enjoy having it. Um, well, these wonderful peacock iridescent colours are often associated with Louis Comfort Tiffany. But um, Tiffany made Favril wear, and what you've got on, on the bottom of this is Aureen. Now, the great competitor to Louis Comfort Tiffany was a man called Frederick Carder. He started Steuben Glass, and this is Steuben Glass's version of Tiffany Favril wear. It's not going to be as valuable as the Tiffany, which at the beginning I, I could have hoped it was when it came out of its paper. Um, but I think if this went to auction, it would make somewhere between three and five hundred pounds. So it was a very good buy you had. It certainly was, but it's still a beautiful object which very I beautiful. shall enjoy. But it's the absolutely genuine article as yes. seen in, in all Long John Silver's it's films fantastic. and everything. Yes. It's glory and weighs a ton. Oh, yeah, no, 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 it's taken both us twins to carry it round the hall for a whole day. Try to put it back together. We can't do that first. No, it takes a wee bit of time. Hang on a second. Yes, hold we have on. to put this. We're very expert at this because we've had so many treasures in it. <laughs> so expert, we're not doing it correctly. I'm sure you're familiar with Hamilton and Inches, who've been jewellers for a very long time in Edinburgh mm -hmm. and still are probably, I think, in business as one of the sort of foremost of the jewellery firms here. But here we've got a signature on the dial of this very obviously French clock of Paris. Right. What we have is a, a piece that they have imported, had their name put on it, but was actually made in France, circa 1900. Are you familiar at all with the technique of the actual way it's made? I think it's called cloisonné, isn't it? Actually, cloisonné is a technique that's basically Chinese. It's the idea where you solder bits of wire onto the surface of metal, mm -hmm. which creates cloisons. These are cells, if you like, the French mm -hmm. word. You fill the cell up with enamel powder, you fire it, it goes to glass, and afterwards you grind and polish the whole thing, and you've got cloisonné enamel, which oh. is exactly, really, what we look like we've got here. Yes. But there's another way of doing it. You take a sheet of metal, make it as like you cast it with all the cloisons in it, effectively. Then it's called champlevé enamel, and you've got something that looks exactly the same. Mm. A couple of other nice details about the clock, the very fine enameled uh, dial, which is very elegant and over the top, really, almost, with flowers and the little circlet of 
and the rather elaborate pierced gilt hands. And also the, the, the cast and pierced mask of flowers yeah. all around. Yes. Exactly. So it's a sort of it's the full Monty, you know, it's got everything going for it, isn't it? Um, I suppose one would probably have to say that it's about three thousand, something like that. Is it? Yeah. That's insurance guy. Oh, I could add another thousand for that if you like. I Make see. it four. No, I'm okay. I'm not joking. I mean, yes, four thousand pounds to replace right. that clock. He would definitely. Need. Every country has a secret service, but the point about a secret service is that it's secret, and yes. so nobody really knows much about it. But this document here in front of us, uh, signed by George the First, which is quite a quite a rare signature of George the First, points out that he is actually giving money for a chap to be a spy. And it's, it's to our trusty and well-beloved John Scrope, or his assignees, the sum of £6,000 for our secret service in that account. Now, that is an amazing sum now, of money. Would that money all go to John Scrope, or would it be for a whole lot of people? Well, I think he would be recruiting spies and yes. doing all sorts of things like that. Yes. But that is just quite incredible, don't you think? I do. <laughs> in those days, £6,000 is a lot How did money. you get it? How did you get this? I found it in my grandfather's papers. And was he related to this uh, scrope chap? No, I wondered whether his wife, wife might have come down through the... She was a certies. Yes. And uh, whether it came down through her family. But this, for a historian, this is, this is brilliant, brilliant yes, stuff. Uh -huh. Then we go on to this next one here. Now, this is a mystery to me. There's nothing particularly in this. It's, it's not a particularly important document. The only important thing is that it's actually signed by a George R. here. Yes. Now, the date here, which is the 5th of July, 1771. Yes. So this is, in fact, a very fine signature of George III. George III, George yes. III. But the one that excites me more than any is this one. Yes. This one, which is to do with money. Yes. Uh, right. Printed money. It's in terrible condition, oh, absolutely appalling. The Where, where's the rest of it? The moss, of course, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anyway, this is to... Isaac Newton, Hopton Hayes, and others in his trust. Now, Isaac Newton, at this time, not only did he, uh, obviously, we all know him about having an apple, an apple yes. falling on his head, but he was also in charge of the mint, the, the, king's, uh, yes. the king's mint, yes. yes uh -huh. And this is an order to pay a sum of money out, 200 pounds, and so on and so forth. But if we turn it over, we have a wonderful reward. We have Isaac Newton's signature there and Hopton Hayes. They'd all actually Who endorsed it. He was his associate. He was under him at the Mint. So that is, that's really very, very exciting. Now, value. <clears throat> this thing, if it was just an ordinary document signed by uh, George I, I would say it was worth £200 because it actually proves that this John Scrope was, in fact, a spy I have to value that much more highly. I would say somewhere in the region of, what, 400, 500 pounds. Uh -huh. It's a very nice piece. This one, which is signed by George yeah. III, is really just, as I said, just, a, just a, a, an ordinary document, yeah. no more than about 200, 250 pounds. But this moth-eaten horror here, <laughs> signed by Isaac Newton, yeah. is very important, and I would have to value this at five thousand pounds. <laughs> you don't know what you've got lying about, do you? <laughs> <laughs> it's Fabergé. It is. Yes. And tell me, is this a gift from somebody? Um, it was a gift uh, to my stepmother from a close family friend to about forty-five years ago, and she, in her turn, very generously passed it on to me. Mm. Well, it's a very magnificent gift in a way, isn't it? And, it, and, and the point about Fabergé objects is, is that they are the grandest gifts that ever were, and they come from a society of unparalleled luxury. People living in pre-revolutionary Russia had their lives decorated in this way in every possible aspect of their lives. Their wallpaper, their furniture, their goldsmith's work, their jewellery, their servants, their horses, their carriages were all of the dramatically high standard of craftsmanship. And Fabergé, in order to survive, had to compete with that. I think perhaps if you're talking about Fabergé, you may be interested in particular um, workmasters. They presided over different workshops, and one of the most famous was Henry Wigstrom, who is the maker of this box. That's who had made it. Uh, yeah, absolutely, and Fabergé allowed him to sign the box as well, and we see his mark in the lid in conjunction with Fabergé. And um, Henry Wigstrom is 
arguably the most distinguished of the Fabergé workmasters. He was maker of the famous imperial Easter eggs, of which there were 50. And he was called the chief workmaster. So this is very, very exciting wow, too. In the lid satin, um, it says Fabergé, St. Petersburg, Odessa and London. If the London branch is shown, we know that it's made after 1903. Yeah. And we also know that Wigstrom took over in 1903. So we can date this box between 1903 and 1915. And uh, it's a box for a very specific purpose. Have you, have, did, do you know what it's for? For cigarettes, in fact. And it, it used to sit on the mantelpiece with cigarettes in it, because my stepmother was a smoker. But uh, I don't smoke cigarettes, so it ceased to be used for that. Um, lurking inside here are two hidden compartments, aren't there? That's Here's right. one. Yeah. And what do we find in there? Uh, that, that's for, for the matches, isn't it? No, that, I think, is maybe something else. It's a little ring of it. Had you found that in there before? I'm afraid I hadn't, to be quite <laughs> honest. <laughs> No. Well, that, I wonder whether you had, actually, no, no, when I, I glimpsed it before. That, that's the ring. Gosh. Well, it's, it's the end of the cigarette holder, and lurking in there yeah. is, is the amber mouthpiece. Yeah. I don't think it's going to come out for us. Um, it's, it's decided to part company with that. Yeah. None of this matters, by the way, but it would make much more sense to us all right now if we were to look and see an amber yeah. mouthpiece well, I didn't know that here. was there either. It's fabulous, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. I think that's wonderful. Yeah. And, and then at the other end, have you found this little compartment here? Yes, I found that little compartment. Yes. There it is. Oh, that's <coughs> the, the striker. Yes, and, and, and have you wondered about that material? Do you know what that is? No, I don't. No. It's shagreen. It's the skin of a Japanese ray. Oh. It happens to be very abrasive. Oh, yeah. That's actually, it almost feels like metal. It fact. does. Yeah. Well, of course, very, very hard. Yeah. And, um, and, and in there would lurk matches. We know matches have been in there because the sulphur in them has actually acted on the metal and turned it black. Yeah. So here's everything for a smoking lady in 1900. She shouldn't have smoked, but then everybody smoked in 1900. And, um, and, and this was what a lady of very high status and probably dramatic wealth would have carried to a dance um, to take three or four cigarettes yeah. hidden within this container here. I think we've got to talk about, a bit about its value, and this is certainly good news and bad news, I'm yeah. afraid. Um, it's not in perfect condition. I realise that. It's had one or two bangs. Well, we all have, really. We've all been knocked about a bit, but unfortunately, it really does matter with Fabergé. Had it been in perfect condition, I wouldn't have shrunk from telling you that it was worth £20,000. 20? £20, £20. No. That is quite a surprise. I had it valued um, a few years back, and I was given a figure of £3,000. Well, somewhere in between lies the truth, because £3,000 is very modest. Yeah. 20000 if it were perfect. Yeah. It isn't perfect, so it's going to be very difficult yeah. to define this. I think I'd like to be certain of a figure of six to 8000 yeah. um, for you at any time, because it is very subtle, very beautiful, very exciting piece of fabric, yeah. and couldn't be more thrilled to have it. Thanks very much for bringing well, it. It's I'm, lovely. Well, very kind of you, and, and fascinating bit of interest. What an intriguing selection, full of surprises. Exotic objects from Russia, tales of espionage. Well, it's more like a John Buchan novel than an antiques roadshow. You'll find all the facts on our website, and you can find our online chat room as well, where you can exchange information with